Thanks for joining us. I have Mark Coletti on the phone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Mark. Uh, your current role is, is what? <laughs> my current role, it, what it says on my business card is staff scientist. But you have an engineering background. Yep. Yep. Uh, once upon a time in a previous life, I was a software engineer. Software engineer. Okay. Yep. And how long have you been doing your current jo job or role? Well, you know, what's kind of funny is that I'm, I'm 53 years old and it's hilarious that they actually deem me as an early career professional. <laughs> so I've actually only been hired on as, uh, as a staff scientist for uh, a couple of years. Um, coming up, you know, more than a couple of years because I'll be, yeah, you know, my third year is going to be this, uh, this August. So, so I'm almost uh, three years as a staff scientist. And, they can, and that's why they consider you a new a newbie to it? Well, you know, it's kind of funny is that there's, there's actually an early career professionals group uh, at work. And, and so uh, I, I asked him, well, you know, there's, there's not like a, a, a sort of an international standard of what is deemed an early career professional. Uh, but for, for scientists, it's generally a, about 10 years. Sometimes it's five years. Um, so, yeah, you know, so even, even at my age, uh, I'm, I'm considered early career because technically I've only been a full-time uh, scientist uh, uh, at the lab for a couple of years. Now, mind you, I was a postdoc for a couple of years before that. So really the, the clock started ticking when I actually graduated from, uh, with my PhD in May of 2014, uh, which is coming up on, oh my God, five years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. So uh, prior to this, you were a software engineer. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. I in the DC area, and um, I uh, work for a variety of, uh, of companies uh, doing mostly government contract work, which is typical for a software engineer in the DC area. And is that something that you knew you always wanted to do, Mark? Well, here's the funny thing is I always, for me, um, early on, I, I knew that I wanted to go into research. So in a sense of software engineering was sort of a, a means to an end because I'm, I'm the kind of person that I try and uh, lift myself up on my own bootstraps. So I knew that if I uh, got hired on as a software engineer, um, I would have uh, enough income where I could kind of pay my way through school. And typically a job you have at, at, as a software engineer, there's usually is one of the, the perks is uh, tuition reimbursement. So I knew it was going to kind of slow me down because I would only be able to kind of plod along taking a class at a time uh, at night. Um, but um, I knew that if I just bided my time that I would actually finish, finish grad school. And along the way, I would actually pick up skills as a software engineer that would be actually helpful to me uh, as, a, as a scientist way on down the road. And that actually turned out to be completely true. That was a really, a, it took me longer to get through the, the system, but it was completely valid. Um, so I've actually picked up a lot of skills that have actually helped me a lot in my current job by deciding to be a software engineer along the way to get to where I am right now. I'm, I'm having trouble seeing where the word scientist comes in. So can you explain a little bit more about what your current job is? Um, Sure. So, uh, so as a, as a, one way I describe being a scientist is that uh, you're, you're learning things, but you're learning things that are special in the sense that you are learning things that no one else has learned before, which is really exciting. And then, then you get to share that with everybody else. And that, then you get to kind of relive your, your excitement uh, all over again. You're almost uh, inventing a process. I mean, if nobody's ever learned it before, it's, it's almost a discovery than a learning, well, it, it, but it not. Is, <laughs> it is about, uh, it is about uh, well, that, it's exploration, it's discovery. That's, that's really the, the, the kind of the essence of being a, a scientist. And there's, there's, a, there's a certain giddy joy that comes along with, with uh, discovering something or learning something that you know that you are the first human being to actually learn this one little thing or see this particular phenomenon. Um, to kind of give a, a good visual, 
so just recently, we, um, uh, and it's not in my field, but it's been in all over the news where we're actually finally able to uh, take uh, kind of a picture of, a, of an actual black hole. Um, and what was cool about that is that there was a, um, an early career scientist, um, um, a, a, a woman, um, who uh, was actually instrumental in kind of bringing together the pieces to put together that first picture. And there is a photograph of her that captures that perfect moment where you can tell she is seeing something. You can see her laptop in front of her where the very first image of that of that black hole is being rendered. And she is, that's a, a, that's a moment in history. No one else has seen that. She is the first one. And that look of just giddy joy, that, that kind of captures the essence of, of, of being a scientist. You, you kind of strive for those moments where it's like, cool, I have this really burning question that I, that I, that I want to answer. And then it's, uh, it's like Christmas. You get, when you get the data and you, you kind of unwrap it, you do the, the initial analysis and visualization, you go like, wow, that's really, that's really interesting. And I'm the first person to see that. And now I, now I can share that with everybody else. And there, there, there's a certain sense of, of, uh, of just, just giddiness that comes along with it. It's just a lot of fun. That's awesome. And one of the things that you, you already allayed, or, uh, said, <laughs> Wow. Um, is uh, how uh, the early training, the early education that you got contributed to where you are now. Uh, so when I ask you the question, you know, what is it, you know, what's really important to know if someone's going to be in this particular career you're in, what are some of the other things you would say about it? Uh, so if somebody wanted to kind of, you know, fall into my, the, the you know, where, where I'm at uh, right now is um, if I had, in a way, it kind of recasts your, your question um, is if I could go back in time, say, and give young, younger me a little bit of advice to kind of help nudge myself along, um, what, what kind of advice would I, would I give? And that would be basically the kind, same kind of advice I would give for anybody that kind of wants to maybe be a scientist someday. And, and one of the, uh, one of the weaknesses that I have and I still struggle with today is that I try to do everything myself. Um, and that means that, you know, from time to time you get stuck and uh, you'll kind of spin your wheels and you're not, you're not going to be able to make any tangible progress. Uh, and I would linger uh, in those doldrums way, way too long. Don't be afraid to go out and, and talk to somebody else. It doesn't have to be your advisor. It could be just a colleague. Sometimes talking through uh, the, the situation you're in can help move you, move you along. Um, so that actually kind of held me back. Uh, that, that problem that I had is that I didn't, I didn't actually uh, seek help um, when, I, when I really needed to. So what, uh, um, so what kind of challenges would you face on a daily basis that one might, you know, t you should go for, get some help, man. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, I'm one of those people that um, if I have uh, too many options, um, I tend to kind of vacillate. And, but, you know, all I need is a nudge. Is, is somebody that's kind of, you know, an objective observer, you know, can say, well, okay, okay, Mark, you have all these, these different options. Here, here's what you could do to kind of narrow them down. It's, it's like um, when you go to a restaurant that has too, too big of a menu, I'm one of those people that, you know, I'm just going to be doing hand wringing for way too long to figure out what it is I want to order. So it's kind of a variation of that problem. If, if, if you're, as you're learning, from time to time, you'll, you'll get in a situation where it's like, I don't know what to do next. I, I don't know uh, what are the next steps. I know what the ultimate objective is, but it's really murky about uh, how to get from point A to point B. And you, you could just go to somebody else and, and just kind of relate where you're at. And, and, and they might be able to kind of hand you sort of a life map to tell you, well, here, here, here are some likely routes that you can take to get from A to B. Do you work alone in teams or independently and part of a team as part of the job you do right now? I, I guess the flippant answer would be yes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because, no, but, but I mean, I'm being kind of serious too, because there's, there's, there's certain elements where I do spend a lot of time uh, by myself, but I'm working on projects. 
uh, with, with other folks. So there's, uh, there's a sense that, you know, I am on a team and there's some common objectives for stuff. Uh, but from, from like moment to moment, a lot of the times I'm sitting, you know, by myself in my, my office. But I also will, you know, when I need to, and I need to chat with other folks. And what's kind of interesting is that, you know, welcome to the 21st century, you know, we, we kind of work remotely. Like I, I, have a, I have a PhD student that's working with me on a project, and he's up in Rochester. So we actually chatted today uh, online to kind of work out some of the things that we need to do uh, for the next set of experiments that we need, we need to run. Um, so in a sense that even though I'm by myself, I'm virtually not by myself because I'm constantly uh, interacting with people, whether it's through email or through chat systems uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and what's also kind of interesting too is that the work I'm doing is that I'm not on any one project. If, if you talk to most any scientist, the model I like to use is the spinning plates model, is that you have like maybe three different projects, right? So there are like three different spinning plates you have to keep going. So your attention kind of jumps from one thing to another. Yeah, and each yeah. one of those projects, you're gonna have different people that you're gonna be working with. Um, and what's kind of cool for me is that uh, it makes things a little bit more interesting is that in a sense every project has its own personality you know sometimes you have pro uh, projects where the, the team members have to meet on a regular basis uh, and some projects are a little bit more loosey-goosey where you don't have to meet as much um, and and that just overall just kind of makes everything a little bit more interesting it's it's not it's not the same old same old from one one thing to the next and that that variety is is part of perhaps of a good a uh, good personality trait would be uh, liking that variety then for this kind of career choice yeah yeah I think you you hit the nail nail on the head is that yeah um, you know for somebody who who like maybe likes to have things really kind of structured and uh, and very well laid out uh, being a scientist is probably not necessarily a um, uh, a role that they, that might be a good fit for them uh, because it's kind of the nature of the beast, right? Uh, one joke I have is, is if uh, as a scientist, if we knew what we were doing, it would be engineering. <laughs> 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 but it's true, uh, and that's part of the job is that we don't know what we're doing and uh, we're we're learning uh, what what to do uh, in a sense. So yeah, you're exactly right. You, you know, if, for for somebody that that really prefers sort of a, a rigid, uh, structured uh, job, and there are plenty of jobs that are like that, um, then, then being a scientist is probably not a good fit. But you went from being an engineer to a all over the place, multiple projects kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, um, because um, um, at the risk of uh, contradicting myself a little bit is that um, to do my work, I have to do, I have to do some engineering, uh, uh, oddly enough, um, because I'm a computer scientist. And, and so part of that job is that, uh, like any other scientist, I have to run experiments. So if you're a chemist, you have to run experiments. If you're a biologist, you run, you run experiments and stuff like that. Computer scientists are really no different. We also have to run, uh, run experiments. But unlike, you know, uh, uh, messing with rats or, or uh, bacterial cultures or anything like that, um, is that we have to do some programming to support um, our experiments. And this is where my software engineering background comes in handy uh, because I'm able to kind of design and implement uh, the experiments in a kind of a controlled, principled fashion such that um, it means I'm less likely to screw up when I'm actually running my experiments. And it also means that the software that I use for my experiments uh, if I engineered them correctly, I can not only share my results, I could share the software too for other scientists that are doing the same kind of thing. And that also kind of makes me feel good because, you know, as humans, if we do something and we share something, whether it's food or, or music or something that we do, we feel good. And it's the same thing with your scientist. Because you feel good when, you, when you're sharing your results, but if you're a computer scientist, if you can share some of the other stuff too, like the software you wrote, uh, in the hopes that it could be helpful to other people. Well, you know what? That makes you feel good too. You know, you know, you're making a contribution in other ways too. That's awesome. And it, would you, if it, would you approach it anything differently now that you know what you know, Mark? Ah. What I was know. that? Was that a uh, ha? A no? What was that? <laughs> you're 
right, because uh, well, I'm I'm trying to uh, I guess kind of understand uh, the, the question uh, in a way that I could I could answer it effectively. Like, no, could would there have been a shorter path? Would there have been uh, aside from being able to take classes without working it, you know, doing it at night and that kind of thing? Right, right. I mean, I I, I could have uh, just jumped right into 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 grad school, uh, but um, that would have been um, even even back in in the 90s um, would have been a little bit harder in the sense that already we were seeing kind of a move in the 90s where students had to pay their own way uh, through, through grad school. Um, so it, it was harder to get uh, grants and, and scholarships and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, there's not really much I, I could, I, you know, I could, I think I could have done besides, of course, you know, um, making sure that I, I got more help and more advice along the way to kind of get me out of the doldrums uh, to get me where I am, where I'm at. I, I, can, I can say um, something that's related uh, to that. Uh, sort of like one of my life uh, philosophies is uh, always try and put yourself in a situation where it's likely that something interesting is going to happen. And that's what, what college is about, and, and even more so grad school, um, because it kind of addresses one of the things um, uh, that I struggle with, or I think we all struggle with, is that well, we know that we, there are things that we don't know. Like, for example, um, I don't know, there's a lot of things about biochemistry I don't know, because I'm not a biochemist. Uh, but, I, if I, but, if I, but I could fix that, right? I could, if I really was interested, I could go and, and pick up a, pick up his books and, and start learning. But then there are the things that you don't know that you don't know. Those are the gotchas, right? Yeah. And so what you need to do is put yourself in a situation where you're, you're likely through random encounters to run into some people or into uh, some literature or what have you that you otherwise would not have run into where you will discover there were things you didn't know you, you, you didn't know that you can go like, wow, that, that's actually really important. Um, so so I has think, to be comfortable with being ignorant because that's the definition of you don't even know what you don't know and that's okay. Right. Actually smart to recognize that you're ignorant. Right. Well, and, and that's, and that's, and that's part of being a scientist in a way is ignorance management. <laughs> ignorance management. I love it. That's so smart. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> you know, you, 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 know, you, you kind of know it's like, okay, well, these are the things that, um, not only do I not know, but I am aware that because I've done literature reviews and stuff like that, where the, none of us know this stuff. Uh, and, and it may be something important to know. And, and so, yeah, in a way, science is, is just collective ignorance management. <laughs> wow. That's an interesting way to look at it. That yeah, is. I haven't really thought of it that way before. So, that would, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so did you end up here or did you intend to be here? I did not intend to be here. Uh huh. Uh, and that and that was one of those things where um, again it comes back to always put uh, put yourself in a uh, situation where something interesting is likely going to happen. So um, like most people that was finishing up um, um, my PhD is you're coming down that last mile and oh god you get tunnel vision because you you've been you've been this thing's been hanging around your neck for literally for years and you are ready to be done and move on. But the thing is, because you have tunnel vision, you haven't really thought about what you're going to do after you graduate. So I had, a, I had an old buddy of mine. Um, he was up at Penn State, uh, and he was a professor up there. And he knew that I was coming down the conveyor belt, finishing up. And he knew exactly what kind of situation I was in, because he has his own PhD. He knew, he knew exactly what it was like. So he said, Mark, why don't you come up and be my postdoc at Penn State? I said, thank God. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do after I graduate. Uh, but I also knew um, that this friend of mine, he had a lot of connections, which increased the likelihood of something interesting was going to happen. So I went up to Penn State for a year. It was my first postdoc. And sure enough, something interesting uh, happened while I was there. Uh, and that is that some fellow came up from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. His name was Boodoo. And he gave, he gave a talk. Um, and what was cool is, I don't remember the title of his talk, but I guarantee you everybody who went to that talk remembers the subtitle. And the subtitle of his talk was, How I'm Going to Waste Your Next Hour. Nice. Well, right off the bat, I like this guy. It's just like, okay, this guy's got a sense of humor. 
right? And, and then I, you know, I sat up and paid attention to his talk. And he talked about all the cool things that were that there was that his team, his group was doing at Oak Ridge. And I said, wow. And again, it comes back to put yourself in a situation where something interesting is going to happen. And I said, this guy is, is has nothing but an interesting thing factory. <laughs> He's got all kinds of interesting things going on down there. So let me go down there to Oak Ridge and, and just kind of plug myself in and see, see what happens, you know, and see what kind of interesting things happen to me. And so that was back in 2015. I've been at Oak Ridge ever since, and it's been one interesting thing after another. So I, it turns out I made a, made a good choice. <laughs> that is so cool. It's clear you love your work. And, and it's a unique personality, I would say. Perhaps you don't know that but you're because you're surrounded by them. But for somebody to want to live by the putting myself in a situation where something interesting is going to happen is, is wonderful. And it's expansive. And it, it leaves the door open for unlimited possibilities. And uh, that, that's a great personality trait for kids that are listening to know that if you have that sense of curiosity, what's over here? What's over here? Were you born with a box cutter in your hand, kid? Let's go. Box, what box? You know, let's do it. Um, that kind of personality style is wonderful for what you're doing, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, all, it's all driven innately by curiosity. And that's what humans are. We're, we're, we're animals that are, that are, that are curious. I, I'll, I'll, show, I'll, I'll tell you a real quick story. So there was a there was a, a famous science fiction writer by the name of Ted Sturgeon. It was back in his heyday, was back in the, in the 60s, I think. And when I was a pimply-faced youth, all of 18 years old, I went to my first science fiction convention, convention, and he was a writer that was one of the guests there. He's actually, he was the guest of honor. And so I, I got some of his books, and I stood in line where he was signing books, right? So I was all nervous because this is the first famous person I'd ever met, right? So I... I was a little, you know, overwhelmed, right? So my turn, I'm getting up to this old wizened guy with like a long pointy wizard beard, right? And I, and I nervously put my, 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 the books that, I, that were his to, to sign in front of him. And I noticed something. Around his neck was a pendant. And on that pendant was a really strange symbol. It was a, it was a Q with an arrow through it. Now you see something like that and you know it's gotta mean something, right? So sure. I was all nervous, right? And I asked, uh, you know, Mr. Sturgeon, you know, I see, see this pendant on your neck. What, what, does it, what does that symbol mean? And he was about to sign my book. The, the pen was poised in midair. And he stopped. And he put that pen down. Uh oh. And he just beamed at me. Oh. Big smile. And, and it just like shone at me like a spotlight. And he said, son, I am so glad you ask that question. And he holds out this pendant and he points at it. He says, this symbol represents that always ask the next question. Always ask the next question. Because he says the moment that humankind stops asking the next question is the moment that the human race goes extinct. Oh, that's a big statement. Wow. I was 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was, I will never forget that. I, I, those words were just baked into my brain. And, but it's so, it is, it is so true on so many levels, not only for, for the entire species, right? But it was also really true for me. And I just carried those words with me from that moment forward. And that is the very essence of being a scientist is always ask the next question. One after the other after the other. I love it. And, and especially if we preface it with how, and uh, because how implies there's an answer. How can we figure this out? How can, whatever, the word how really does make a difference as right. to, as to uh, why isn't this working? Well, you get those answers too, but you, it's probably not the ones you're looking for. Yeah. Well, well you know, but in my case, the how is the engineering part. So, okay. So you know, why is this happening? Well, to, to answer the why, I have to want how am I going to answer that question? How am I going to, how, how am I going to get to the why? And so that way I, I engineer uh, the programming to support answering that question. So, so that's where the, the kind of the dual role comes in, where I can lean on my old experience as a software engineer to help me uh, be a scientist. And, and I find that now 
I have students, I have mentees. Um, I actually got the, this kid that's at Rochester, he's coming down to ORNL in a week. And um, so he's, he, he's your typical, you know, computer science uh, grad student and that he doesn't have any real programming experience. Well, this is where I can help him, right? So I look at some of his code and I go, you know, you know, if you just did this this way or you did these things, um, your code will be better, uh, it will be less brittle, and it will help you down the road to do better science. So I'm able to kind of share, you know, some of my, you know, time as an engineer with the next uh, crop of scientists that are coming up to kind of help them a little boost. And that's actually also part of the job too, right, is, is mentoring. And I like that, you know, it's, it's good to know that, you know, some of the things that I can pass down the line is helping the next generation coming up. Is there a, any, as we wrap this up, Mark, is there any advisements that you might have to kids that are, that are listening as to uh, focus on grades or external like, extracurricular activities that would be beneficial to them? Well, yeah, you know, I guess uh, grades are, are, yeah, are, are important and all that, but it's, it's, um, um, it's the experiences uh, that you get, the connections that you make. You know, I'm still friends with some of the professors I had when I was an undergraduate. Um, and uh, it's those, those connections you make outside the classroom that in some ways are more important than the classroom itself. It's, and now I'm not saying that the grades are not important. Uh, they, they are also, you know, uh, are important. But there's some of the, uh, a lot of the learning happens outside of the classroom, just hanging out with people uh, on campus um, that are like in the, in the same field that you're interested in and just talking to them. Uh, you'll, you'll learn so much, um, you know, because the, the, the classroom is, is there to kind of lay down the foundational knowledge uh, that you'll need to kind of go forward in life. But um, when you talk to the colleagues and, and, and find out, you know, what is it you, you're working on and uh, what, what questions are you, uh, are you pursuing? You know, that's, that's where you kind of tap into um, uh, the kind of knowledge and the skill sets that, that can actually really, really help you uh, for the rest of your life. You, is, there just, a fo is there a focus of um, sciences or maths or anything uh, for, say, the high schooler who's considering the listening? Because it's very exciting to listen to you talk about your, what you do. It really is. Very compelling. Well, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so, you know, yeah, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. So, of course, you know, computer science related classes are, are important. You know, programming classes. Um, and, and chances are, if somebody is already, as a student, is, is, in, is already engaged in this, uh, what, they, what you might find yourself doing is, is, is doing, doing stuff for fun, for uh, programming for fun. And here it is, I'm 53 years old. and um, uh, just recently, I was in something called a hackathon. So uh, to kind Ooh, of explain, I love hackathons. Those are a blast. Hackathons are a blast. And so what was great, it, it was here in downtown Knoxville. It was just a weekend. It was just two days. It was so it's over, really over, over a 24-hour span. And you had people that were in high school all the way up to, to geezers like me, right? Yeah, <laughs> people from all walks of life, you know, men and women. Um, and uh, we were all having fun. And, um, and, and what was really cool is that there was kind of a focus to the hackathon. Uh, and the focus was uh, the city of Knoxville is really kind of on the, on the cutting edge uh, for a lot of different things. And, and so what the city of Knoxville had done is they approached this group here of, uh, of local hobbyists, really, and said, you know, we're struggling with some things uh, that we figured that uh, the hackathon could help us out with. And so they posed a series of challenges that if you met these challenges, you actually came up with solutions and even just a 24 hour span, uh, these solutions could actually turn out to help the community. Yes. And for the team I was on, we, we, it, was a, it was the waste, man, it was a waste management problem, which doesn't sound like a sexy problem, but it was, a, it was an easy problem for us to tackle. And that was that if you have people that repeatedly um, uh, have problems with, with their trash, their trash is overflowing or a car is blocking and what have you, the city wanted to send out postcards, right? But they were using like a, a spreadsheet, they were using a, a clunky manual system, and me and my buddies that formed the hackathon team says, you know what, no, we could come up with something, boom, just like that, that actually would automate this process and make it a lot easier for the city. And we actually, there were prizes, we actually, um, we won 3D printers. 
So there was, so we had to, we had to do something right to, to put together a solution uh, that would actually work for the city. But you know what? I, I think that even if they didn't offer prizes, we would have still have done it because it was just, it was just a lot of fun. Um, and I could tell everybody there was, was having fun too. And, and everybody was learning. You know, I, even at my age, I was learning stuff, you know, working with my colleagues, you know, I learned stuff about databases because I'm, I'm not really a database guy. So it's like, oh, okay. So I learned, I learned a few things myself. But in looking at the high school kids that were there and the college kids that were there, and I could tell they were really getting a lot out of it, especially when they were coming around and, and, and talking to us about kind of the, what kind of stuff that we were doing and how we, how we were doing things. So they learned from us. We were learning from each other. And, and that's always a, a positive and fun experience. That sounds fantastic. Congratulations to you and your team. And well, the inventions that come out of a hackathon are amazing and useful and public knowledge. So yeah, access, accessibility is, um, you know, all of a sudden it's everybody's. No wonder we're making exponential leaps and bounds in, in advancements because of the, just the, the community of sharing. It's yep. wonderful. It's a wonderful part of what you do. Are there any other things that I, I you wish I had asked you about what you currently do that you think a young person should know? Ah, uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to trying to could, could be covered a lot of we covered a lot of we stuff. did it was pretty comprehensive. Uh, well, I I would I would say that you know uh, especially if you're like in high school or or even in college because um, you know you're you're, you're kind of maybe floundering around trying to figure out what, what it is you want to do. And, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell folks um, that are that age is that you may change your careers uh, several times. Uh, and it's not that you didn't find a good match. You might have found a good match, but then as you grow older, you grow as a person and you, you may literally just grow out of your job and get bored with it and you want to do something else, right? And that's just part of the natural progress of, of life. And so in a way, even though I kind of knew what I was going to be doing, I kind of did that because I was a software engineer and I could have just stayed that. I was comfortable. I was making good money. Um, but I knew that I was going to kind of molt, as it were, and, uh, and change into a, you know, a, a different person. Uh, to get to the career that ultimately wanted wanted so it may be that you um you don't be afraid to change things if they don't feel right don't feel like you're you're locked into something if it doesn't feel right change it do something yeah, that, that, i'm so glad you said it that way mark because the there's a consistent theme here of people following their inner knowing knowingness or their heart or the nudges and sometimes you, you just can't ignore them. And sometimes that still small voice is still a small voice. And it can be, you know, challenging to listen to when surrounded by people that are perhaps pressing the thumb on a child's f future and their decisions and say, you, thou shall follow. And the truth is that that person doing that doesn't have to live that life. You do. Yeah. So that's great, great closing advice. Thank you. They're doing their, they're doing their, their children a disservice by, by, by forcing them onto on the career um, even though they may have their best interest in their mind and because you know they're the parents right but no ultimately you got you got to follow your own dreams that's right we all came here to do something it's just what is it <laughs> it's a, right, right? And it may change too you know right you, you right may do multiple somethings and that's okay <laughs> <laughs> it, it has been an absolute delight interviewing you thank you for your contribution to society to our future to all the things that you're building and doing and how excited you are that you that when you bring that energy to your job the it, it changes the outcome and uh, it's clear you have found a, a, something to be so passionate about all the time and uh, bravo to you thank you so much once again for sharing your insights and wisdom and stories and advice this has been fascinating well, you know, and, and thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Well, we really appreciate it. This is going to be a great project that will help a lot of children to be able to make a better and a more informed decision. You may have more mentees in the future. All right. <laughs> good. Thank you again. Thank you all for listening. Stay tuned. We will no doubt have another interesting interview in a career that you never expected that you might want to do. All right. <laughs>